Steve is a professor emeritus from the University of North Carolina Medical School. He taught human metabolism and nutrition to med school, uh, first year med students for 40 years. He, uh, and he was the course director for the first year medical students. His research focused on a, a cancer, anti-cancer drug called cisplatinum. And he worked on how that molecule interacted at the cellular uh, or molecular level with DNA. Uh, he has over 130 peer-reviewed scientific journal articles on his work, and he's well known in the field of cancer research as well as nutrition. So, thank you. That's really impressive. I'm very happy to have Steve here, and I guess we can start maybe in two more minutes, or if um, let's just start. I think um, we have a lot of people still missing, but they can. If they missed the very beginning, they can watch the replay when we put it in the membership area. Think so. Okay, so you should be able to see the screen now. And please ask the questions in the chat. If you have questions, we can ask um, Dr. Cheney all of the questions after the presentation. And I'll, I'll I'll stop a little while and give you a chance to ask questions and answer ask questions anyway. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, Alicia asked me to talk about the science behind the Shackley supplements. So I'm not going to go into any kind of detail on supplements themselves and how they're designed and that sort of thing, but really to acquaint you with the science. And I think, you know, whenever we talk about science and clinical proof, it's good to kind of look a little bit at the competition um, just to you know, just to just for contrast, because I think everybody starts with the assumption that everybody's really, you know, all these claims are true. Everybody has good science behind their products. So mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the smoke and mirrors in the industry first. I'll go through that pretty quickly. But uh, so the question is, where's the proof? Because everybody claims they've got good science, but often that's false. Everybody claims they have clinical studies. That's often false. And I define clinical studies as studies that are actually done with humans. Mm -hmm. um, not animals, not, not cell culture, not test tubes. Um, many claim they have a long list of publications. That's kind of misleading. And I'll talk a little bit about why that can be in a minute. So how do you know what's true? You know, we're going to just kind of take a peek behind the curtain. And I want to help you maybe become more discerning for the claims that you see of supplement companies. So I'm going to give you four questions to ask when you're looking at their claims. So the first, first question is, what kind of study is it? And as Suzanne said, I, my career was in cancer research, cancer drug development. So that really, I really learned a lot from that. And I can tell you, if you look at the test tube, you may, you may start with a thousand compounds that look like they're very promising for cancer, defeat some kind of cancer. But then you go to cell, then you go to cells, cells and culture. Usually these are human cancer cells and culture. And what you find is that some of these compounds aren't taken up by the cell. The cell has an amazing defense mechanism. So some of them, as soon as they're taken up, they're pumped back out of the cell. Some of them are in, inactivated in the cell. So over that thousand compounds that look promising in test tubes, only around a hundred look good in cell culture. Well, the next stage is to take them to animals. Now you've got a whole animal there and you know the liver may inactivate them and uh, detoxify them. The kidney may pump them out. They may never get into the bloodstream or get into the cells. So of the original thousand, now you're down to 10. And then when you go to human clinical studies, if you're lucky, one of those thousands will actually work in humans and actually go, you actually be, you know, actually become a useful cancer drug. Um, I was very fortunate that of the compounds I worked with, one of them made it into the clinic uh, and is still still widely used. But you know, I've had colleagues who work just as hard as me, who are just as uh, <clears throat> just as smart as me, but you know, they they never had that kind of success. So you know, it's it's it really is. You're looking for that needle in a haystack. So when you evaluate clinical studies of supplement companies, you see their publications. First thing you ask is what kind of study is it? Give you an example from antioxidants. If you look at test tube studies, it's something called a high RX score, but they may, may just say 
uh, our compound has is a very powerful antioxidant. But those studies were done in a test tube. If you actually look at their look at their listed studies, well, again, a lot of those don't get into the cell. So we've got a cell culture. You're down to hundred. Uh, in animals, they don't get into the bloodstream. In humans, maybe one of them will show clinical benefit. So, you know, that's why I say don't really put a whole lot of trust in studies that are in the test tube, in cell culture, or even in animals. Unless you see studies done with humans, I wouldn't put much trust in it. So the first kind of first question you've got to ask is what kind of study is it? Okay, the second question you want to ask were the study published in peer-reviewed medical journals. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this by, by slideshow today, just because some of these illustrations kind of really tell the whole story. So this is kind of a cartoon I found a while back uh, with a scientist with his publication. He's done the research. He's got, he's got studies he wants to publish, but you got to run, run through a gauntlet before it actually gets, the paper gets accepted in a peer review journal. And so let me kind of describe the process. The first step is it goes to the editor and sometimes the editor says, well, this paper, this study isn't right for our journal and rejects it out of hand. Um, if it gets past the editor, it goes to three or four reviewers, some of whom may be your competition. And they look at it, look over it very, very critically. So the first thing they ask is, well, is that hypothesis reasonable? If it isn't, they'll reject the paper. Then they go to the, to the experimental design. Uh, was experimental design adequate to test the hypothesis? Did you have enough, enough subjects in the study to come to a useful conclusion? So if, it, if they don't think that's right, they'll either reject the paper or tell you you have to do more experiments, rewrite the paper. Next step is they, Look at your data analysis. And if they don't agree with the way you analyze the data, again, either reject the paper, tear to rewrite it. Um, and then the final thing, they look at your conclusions. They ask are your conclusions really supported by the data. And again, if they don't agree with your conclusions, they can they can reject your paper. So it really is like running a gauntlet to get a paper published. Now you might say, well, why do you go through all of that? Well, that's the uh, that's the power of science, is that it, you're constantly testing these, and it's not easy to get something published. Um, you know, th that's, that's really what makes uh, science trustworthy. But some companies will just, on their website, they'll show you beautiful looking data, or they'll have white papers that they list as publications, but they've never actually ended up in a, you know, never gone through peer review, they've never ended up in a journal. It's just data they're showing you that's never been through the peer review process. So the data haven't been peer reviewed, you probably don't believe a word of it. And then the second thing is where the study's actually done with their product. Because a lot of companies cite studies done with ingredients that are used in their product. That's what I call borrowed science and it can be misleading. So let me give you one example. Um, Shackley, when this was years ago, when they were developing a fiber supplement to lower blood cholesterol levels. At that point, there were several studies that said guar gum is an ideal fiber for lowering cholesterol levels. So they made a guar gum supplement, ran some clinical tests. It didn't work. Um, so they, they X'd out plan A. Made, they revised their study, but it's still basically a guar gum supplement. Maybe they figured they hadn't formulated it right. Second study didn't work. And by the way, those studies weren't published. Those were just in-house, just in part of the process of developing a product that works. And then finally, they went completely to a whole set of different fibers, made a supplement. That clinical study showed it worked. That was the one they published. But, you know, it just they could have gone on like many other companies and say, oh, guar gum has been proven to lower cholesterol levels. Here's our guar gum fiber supplement. But that can be misleading. That might not work. Um, and finally, were the results published in what I call an advertising journal? So the advertising journal has no peer review. The author of the company pays for publication. And it used to be very easily, easy, very easy to distinguish. There's a uh, website called PubMed for all the clinical 
of publications, all publications in major journals. And, you know, so the scientific, the peer reviewed journals were there. And the other journals were in Whole Foods or the supermarket. Um, but the publishing industry has changed, as you might suspect. The journals all used to be supported by subscriptions. Uh, when I first started my career, if you wanted to keep up in your area of research, you had to subscribe to three or four key journals at three or four hundred dollars a journal. The libraries had to pay a lot more to keep them on the shelves. But now they're open access, which means they're free. So once again, the author of the company pays for publication. The publication in, publishing industry is very competitive. So the temptation is great to go over to the dark side. So I'll give you one example. Um, this was a study done on what we called the fake chocolate study. The study supposedly said that chocolate and chocolate aids weight loss. So you just have to eat chocolate and you're going to lose weight. Now that's something that's very appealing, but most people say mm, that's a little hard to believe. But that was what the study does. It was widely public, widely, widely shared. It was actually done by not a scientist, but an investigative journalist who had identified some of these dark side journals. So he created a very poorly designed study, had a doctor in India perform a study. And this wasn't even a doctor at a major medical center in India. This was a rural doctor in India, a random doctor, had him perform the study, sent it to a dark side journal. It was published in 48 hours, no, no peer review. And then he sent the press release to European papers 20 major papers headlined the results that eating more chocolate helps you lose weight. Um, so that's what can happen. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that every company does that. There are some companies out there, some reputable companies that do have clinical studies done with their product that are, that are peer reviewed, published in good journals. Uh, but, you know, the, none of them have as many publications and as long-term publications as Shackley has. So that's really where I wanna talk about the science behind Shackley. So um, Shackley claims to be the most clinically proven wellness company in the world. So how can they claim that? So it could be there are 142 clinical studies that are done with their products and published in peer reviewed scientific journals. It could be that many of those studies were independent studies done by top-notch scientists at major US universities. But it could be the Czech is the only company that has short, medium, and long-term studies showing their products work. And the medium and long-term studies are important because most of the other studies that are out there are very short-term. So actually it's all three of those things. So, but let's start with the studies. Now I'm going to focus on this one and I'm going to circle around to it later on. But this is a 20 year study. Shackley referred to it as a landmark study. It was performed by Glad Dr. Gladys Block at UC Berkeley. So eminent nutrition sci nutritional scientist, major university. She had a hypothesis that a comprehensive supplement program would be much more effective than individual supplements. Um, so she looked around for companies willing to test that hypothesis. She approached six different companies that were like Shackley, and um, five of them turned her down cold because she told them that she controlled the data. And if she found their products didn't work, that's exactly what she would publish. Shackley had enough, our CEO had enough confidence in Shackley products. He said, okay, go ahead. Use our, use our uh, consumers as, as getting guinea pigs. So this was a 20 year study comparing people use no supplements. Those were the blue bars. People use just uh, multivitamins from another company. Those were the pink bars. And people who use the Shackley supplements, those were the green bars. So if you look at things like heart attack, angina, congestive heart failure, those were threefold lower in the Shackley group than in the other two groups. If you look at diabetes, that was fourfold lower, and those differences were highly significant. Now, these groups were matched with age, weight, gender, ethnicity. Um, so it, it wasn't one of those things. 
it really was a difference in what they were what they were supplementing with. Now you can't rule out all the lifestyle factors and that sort of thing, but you know that's a very powerful study, and that's a twenty year study. So, um, what Shackley did when that result came out is they said, okay, what were the major supplements that people were using? And they put together a package with a protein supplement because most of the people that had been in that 20-year study were using Shackley's protein supplement and a, a little strip there called Vitalizer, which was basically the comprehensive solution. Between these two, they covered all the major supplements that the people in the Shackley study were taking. There's a multivitamin there, there's extra B, B vitamins, there's extra C, there's extra E, there's omega-3s, there is CoQ, CoQ10, there are carotenoids, there's a probiotic, all in that one strip. So that was a comprehensive, comprehensive solution based on the landmark study. Now, most of the clinical studies I will show you are based on this regimen. But I will, I should tell you that you know, just, a, just a couple of years ago, Shackley introduced a personalized solution, a way to determine which of those supplements are the ones that are going to be most beneficial to you. So you've got a couple of choices there, personalized or comprehensive. But let's go back to comprehensive because these studies were based on that. So here's a short-term study. After two months, people are using that, that combination, um, already saw 9% lower cholesterol levels, 7% lower triglyceride levels, 7% higher levels of HDL. All of those are measures of heart health. Now, if this was all that Chackley did, we would be like all of the other, well, all the other reputable companies out there because they've got short-term studies like this. And these studies say, well, this might help your heart. But I think all of you know that cholesterol by itself is not an absolute predictor of heart disease. Triglycerides by itself is not an absolute predictor. Um, these are short-term studies that might show that these, that these products are beneficial for heart health. So here's a six month study. Now we're sort of weaning out the competition. Very few people do a six month study, but this one threw through an exercise. So here, what you saw is at the end of six months, um, and this was, a, this was a group of people who were 55 years old and older. Most of them were overweight and they were put in a supervised, there's an independently run study, um, but they were put in a supervised exercise program three days a week at the local YMCA. It was you know, a mixture of cardio and respiratory and, um, and, and <clears throat> cardio and strength training. And at the end, and half of them were just doing what their regular thing. The other half were given the Shackley shake and the vitalizer. To, they were using the shake right after their workout, using the vitalizer on a daily basis. So if you look at the center, that's the increase in lean muscle mass at the end of six months. And it was 33% higher in the Shackley group, uh, the people who are on the Shackley program. If you look at weight loss and body fat loss, those were much higher, much greater in the Shackley group. So what happens if you increase muscle mass and you lose fat mass? Well, basically you shape up. And just these are just sort of two figures. But if you start at 180 pounds, you lose 30 pounds. So now you're at 150. If you just, if you lose, because with most exercise, most programs, you lose muscle fat, muscle mass, and fat mass. So you end up looking like the lady on the left. But if you just lose fat mass, you end up looking like the lady on the right. So the question is, which one would you choose? Now, there's this whole science behind why that happens and how the protein supplement was developed. I could do that another time, but time restrictions, I want to get on to further studies. Um, what about nine months? So now you're again looking at the vitalizer and shake plus exercise. You see increased muscle mass still, decreased. Now you're starting to see some other health benefits, decreased in blood pressure and actually an increase in bone density. Um, so that was, you know, these are very important changes in people who are over 55. 
So your body is starting to change for the better in just nine months. At three to five years, and there's almost nobody in our industry that has three to five year studies, um, things are getting better. So now your cholesterol, crystal levels are even lower. Triglyceride levels are even lower. Um, HDL levels are even higher. And now you're starting to lower hemoglobin, lower hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure of blood sugar control. Um, so this is a three to five year study. Oh, and also decreased blood pressure in that study as well. So now we're gonna circle back to the 20 year study, the landmark study. And again, you're seeing even more changes here, but now you throw in homocysteine, levels decrease, that's a measure of brain health. Uh, C-reactive protein levels decrease, that's a measure of biological stress, inflammation, if you will. So we're seeing it's starting to see huge benefits there. And again, blood pressure is down, but this then again, these are, we go back to this chart. I just wanna point this out and emphasize, this is a 20 year study. Nobody else in our industry has a study that long. And here we're looking at health outcomes. We're not looking at things that might affect heart health or might affect diabetes. We're actually looking at health outcomes here. Um, and again, that's a published study in a peer reviewed scientific journal. <clears throat> Shackley has even taken that one further. So then what they call the landmark two study, this is at 30 years. So another 10 years looking at the same group of people. Um, this was done, I forgot the scientist's name, but it, it was at Rutgers University. Um, but this is now, if you look at the prevalence of diabetes, and here <clears throat> they did it longitudinally, so age 30 to 70 or over. And they also broke it down a little bit more. Now you're comparing the Shackley supplement users that are shown in blue, so yes, you do get some increase in diabetes as Shackley supplement users get older. We're not completely imperv impervious to aging, but if you look at the non-supplement users in green, the multivitamin users in red, the single supplement users from other companies in purple, or people are using two or more supplements, so multiple supplements from other companies in black, none of them did anywhere near as well as the Shackley group. Um, so again, this is a 30-year study. Again, we're looking at health outcomes. Nobody else has a study like this. 30 years, that's unheard of. Um, also, if you look at heart, heart disease, same sort of thing. The Shackley group is on the left. All the other groups are on the right. Huge difference in heart cardiovascular disease. Um, medicine use. Um, now, this is after 30 years, so this group's getting fairly old. But if the, the group, the people in the group who are in the 20 to 39 year range had 97 lower, 97 percent lower medication use, the ones in the 40 to 59 age group had 89 percent lower medicine use, and the 60 plus group had 83 lower medicine use. And you know, all medicines they're there for useful purposes, but they all have side effects. So the more you can avoid those medications, the better off you are. So look, at, nope, I'm it's going to cover something about one of our cellular anti-aging supplement. Great story, but I'm going to save that for another time. And just say, what is your health span? Because for most people, you've heard it's all downhill after age 30. And, and that's really what it is. Lifespan is how long we live. Health span is how long we live healthy. And yes, for most people, it's all downhill after age 30. You know the statistics, but it doesn't have to be that way. So with that, I am open for questions. Looks like there are a number of questions in the chat, so we can start with those. And um, yes, Alicia said, I love Vivix. I make a free pre-workout drink with it. Uh, I do look 10, look 10 years younger than I used to, so that's my thing. Uh, great, yeah, we can talk about that another time. I just didn't, you know, I wanted to keep it short today. 
Let's see any other questions in here. Can you talk about soy a little bit? We're taught to be scared of soy. Um, so, <clears throat> Uh, can you talk about it? So uh, the, the supposed dangers of soy are really um, much overplayed. Uh, they're, they're, they're mostly fantasy. So what happened is there were some mouse studies, and these were studies done in a very special type of mouse. Um, they were what we call nude mice, but that's just a, a I don't know how that word came. Well, they're hairless. That's why they're called nude mice. But they also have no immune system. So they put human cancer cells in nude mice. And these were breast, human breast cancer cells in nude, nude mice. Um, they uh, injected those mice with soy, soy isoflavones. And it stimulated the growth of the cancer cells. But remember, these are, these are mice with no immune, no immune system. So um, on that basis, you had all these scare things that soy was going to increase the risk of breast cancer. Now, mind you, subsequent, subsequent studies showed that um, if you have mice with an intact immune system, the soy actually decreased the risk of breast cancer. Uh, this was a genetic. This was a this was a strain of mice that was genetically predisposed to have breast cancer within the lifespan of a mouse. Um, but they had an intact immune system. You gave them the soy isoflavones, and you suppressed the development of breast cancer. Uh, all the human clinical studies have shown that soy either has no effect on breast cancer or that it suppresses it. Um, there's no, no worry about heart or liver, but for anybody that's scared of soy, soy I, I mean, I understand some people, it's a hard thing to work through. Um, and, <clears throat> but uh, we, so Shackley does have a plant non-soy uh, protein supplement. Has the same same system for increasing muscle mass, but now it's using a mixture of pea and rice protein. Uh, what fiber did work? Publication. So I can get back to you with the publication. Um, Suzanne, if you have access to uh, Shackley's catalog, you can probably find it in there. I don't remember offhand. It was a mixture of four fibers. So I don't remember exactly which fibers they used, but I can I can uh, look up and send Alicia the publication, and then she can yeah, share. Exactly, does that doesn't have that anymore, but you can find it in the publication. Oh, okay. You know um, about uh, soy products. I think the soy, the quality really matters. And unfortunately, talking about supplements, talking about research, um, when I studied uh, to become a nutritionist, we, we had a whole class about how the studies can be funded by certain industries. And a lot of times, unfortunately, unfortunately, the myths are born that live for 10, 20, 30 years that I absolutely have um, uh, studies that are not valid and 10, 20 years later, people find out that the whole thing was created out of nowhere. And the studies were not, um, there was not a quality done studies or the industries fund the studies in, in, um, in an effort to sabotage each other, <laughs> depending on, you know, depending on the products. And it's, it's pretty sad, but nutrition can be wild, wild west. The supplement industry can be wild, wild west, you know, the new fat diets. And we, we had a uh, talk about that. We we'll see if it's on my YouTube channel about how myths are born. Yeah. And how the diets, uh, why, why we're failing uh, following certain diets. Yeah. So uh, it's funny you mentioned myths because um, I have two books I've written just to help get around, help people understand some of those myths. Uh, <clears throat> one is called slaying the food myths. Mm -hmm. And the second is called slaying the supplement myths. 
And I do mm -hmm. talk about the soy myth in that book and give you all the references of the mm -hmm. studies that, that, you know, disprove that. Yes, look at look at the uh, look at the book uh, slaying the supplements myth. It's pretty. Yes, it, it's pretty eye opening. <laughs> Thank you so much Steve, for your time. Yes, I really wanted to share Shockley um, products with you ladies and everybody who's going to be watching because for seven years, a lot of companies tried to make me to use their products and I never I never liked any company that um, tried to get me on board and the Shockley was the first one. Absolutely love it. I use it for my children. Um, I'm gradually going to switch a lot of the house products and my own personal um, body products and faith products to Shockley and Vivix. I absolutely in love with Vivix um, because I, uh, hold on one second. I'm mute. Yeah, now I can. I'm mute. Um, uh, Suzanne for a second. So um, about Vivix, I, um, I use it in my pre-workout drink, pre drink because I absolutely can't find the pre-workout drinks where I approve all of the ingredients. So I make my own. I do get my, um, um, you know, I get the powder sourced. I buy them separately, then I mix it. And then I add water and I add Vivix. And I know that Vivix, we can talk about it later. It's uh, the Shockley, they have amazing studies on its effect on your, um, um, uh, Steve, can you, can you give us just a couple of words on that one? So a couple of things that I can share. I mean, I had the illustrations in the PowerPoint, but I won't go there. Just be real quick about yeah. it. So a couple of the major things in terms of clinical studies um, is that, uh, there was one clinical study where they wanted to look at the effect on inflammation. So they partnered with a doctor at SUNY New in Buffalo, who developed a clinical human assay, human clinical assay that created, well, recognized, I should say, a human situation which creates massive inflammation and massive reactive oxygen species in a very short period of time. Uh, now, you might guess what that is, but I can just tell you briefly, it was a fast food meal. So, you know, egg McMuffins, uh, the, the hash browns, Coke, you know, that would, that creates massive inflammation in a very short period of time. And just one teaspoon of Vivix taken along with it, completely wiped that out. Um, inflammation reactive oxygen species are bad dudes. There's another one that was even more impressive, um, done, done on telomeres. Now telomeres are the tips of your chromosomes, um, but you can think of them as analogous to the tips of your shoelaces. So if you've ever lost a tip on your shoelace, you know that that shoelace is for all, pro for all purposes, it's, it's worthless. So when you so what happens is those telomeres on our chromosomes gradually get shorter as we age, and once the telomeres are gone, that cell is gone. So as we age, we lose cells because we've lost the telomere tips to our chromosomes, and as it accumulates, that's eventually we're gone. So this was a study looking at people who had used the Vivix and the other Shackley products for 10 years and compared them to healthy non-smoking adults in the same area. And what they found is the telomere length in the Shackley group at age 80 was the same as the telomere length in the non-Shackley group at age 40. That's amazing. So those are two clinical studies with Vivix um, that just, you know, show you how powerful it is yes it is pretty powerful so i use it in purpose of reducing inflammation when i work out and also um because i used to have the, all the pcs symptoms inflammation is something that follows uh uh the problem and uh i also absolutely love the taste of vivix so i use it in my homemade pre-workout drink because 
I really love the taste. I know that um, it's anti-aging, that it reduces my, the inflammation, and I also make uh, make the drink that tastes good. I uh, mix all of my amino acids, all of the uh, herbs, everything that I use in my pre-workout drink, and I know that it tastes good. I have everything that I uh, like in there, and I'm in control, <laughs> and it tastes good, right? So Alicia, that is, uh, that's an amazing idea. I'd never thought about that before. So yeah. putting in your pre-workout drink to reduce inflammation from the workout. Yes, absolutely. Because You're one you smart know, cookie. Thank you. <laughs> because of the mTOR, you know, every time we do have the inflammation and we love the, uh, the, the looks, but, you know, everything we can minimize the aging. I'm pretty big on that one because my thing is we can live until 120 and 30 years old body. So this is my thing. I research it. So Vivix is something I really like. All right. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Have that a great was, day. That was an awesome one. Thank you for your time.